Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. Today's episode is called Revolutionary Investment Opportunities. The world is always changing and at the moment there are some seismic shifts happening in society. They are happening whether you like them or not and there are far-reaching consequences for our way of life and how society operates. Today, we will delve into these opportunities that we're currently positioned for in our portfolios. Join us today to find out more and how you can profit from these two. Just a reminder, the information in this podcast is general advice only and is not intended to be specific for your personal situation. If you do want to discuss your personal financial situation and how to improve that, you can book a call with me or one of the advice team at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact. Today, as always, we have Nucleus Wealth Chief Investment Officer and co-founder, Damien Klassen. Welcome. Hey, Sam. G'day, Davo. My name's Sam Kerr. I'm the Head of Advice at Nucleus Wealth. Just a reminder, the themes in this podcast are a reflection of our thinking, which we implement across all our active portfolios. You can find out more about our offering in the description notes below. The show normally is recorded live every Thursday at 12.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but today is a pre-record, uh, but normally you can jump onto the Nucleus Wealth YouTube channel and you can ask any questions that come to mind and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. We are also available on all major podcast platforms, so you can have a listen there if you prefer. Until the end of the year, we still are offering a free no obligation super review. Uh, we'll give your super a health checkup. Uh, we'll have a look at the fees you're currently paying how you're invested and make sure you're taking advantage of any of the tax saving opportunities on offer. So you can book a call with me or one of the advice team at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact. So those are all the formalities. Uh, Damo, over to you to get the ball rolling. Yeah. So um, revolutionary investment opportunities. I just wanted to sort of, I guess, uh, define what, what, what we're talking about here because we, we run a an annual, usually do an annual podcast on, on mega trends, and uh, I'll, I'll speak briefly about those in, the, in a second. But there's there's a little bit slightly different what we're what we're dealing here with is in terms of these investment opportunities. So so the mega trends are these big long term sort of fifty year trends that are playing out that are, that are influencing everything sort of um, as this underlying trend throughout it. What we're looking at here is some of these specific stock specific themes and which sectors. Uh, that means that we're sort of more or less exposed to uh, because of these themes. So, so more about the individual stocks, and less about this sort of overall philosophical um, you know, rising tide. And this is more about, you know, maybe if you think about the individual waves that are coming through, this is more about those individual waves. And so we're going to talk about um, some of the themes to, ch to chase, uh, some of the themes to avoid. And then uh, finally, this whole idea that we'll, I want to keep going back to is, is that price really matters with all these. Some of these themes are going to become flavor of the minute and price is going to roar and you just need to be quite careful about whether you're buying in at the top of the uh, the cycle or whether you're um you know the top of the intermediate wave and it'll go back down and, and you might end up over five years doing all right but but you know that where you actually get in is is important with all these as well making sure that you're not just overpaying for assets so i'll start with a, a just a um a chart from uh Ray Dalio, just sort of showing there's, there's sort of these three lines, and this is this idea that we run in the mega trends, is that um, you've got this long-term underlying productivity growth that sort of that under, underlay underlies everything. Uh, then you've got a, a long-term debt cycle and a short-term debt cycle that sort of overlay each other as well. And so, and this is sort of like a good way. I mean, it's it's, it's not it's obviously not exact. It's just a it's a, a picture of how things evolve and it's a very good way of thinking about some of these long-term trends that we're, what we're really trying to find is this, this productivity growth type line, the one that runs through the middle and it's just going to, the actual effects are on that very thin up and down line all the time. That's where, that's what you see day to day, but keeping in mind that, that, you know, we do have these underlying trends. And so uh, the mega trends, which we're sort of tracking are these big 50 year uh, forces and, and we'll go into more detail of that over the Christmas break, we'll run a uh, another mega trends version. Um, is is inequality and the sort of rising inequality that's that's happened over the last sort of fifty odd years and and where that's going. Uh, a lot of demographics, in particular the uh, the baby boomers, sort of following through where they are in their cycle and, and what that's doing to to different markets. Uh, the rise of women in the workforce and and how that's sort of starting to tail off now and what that means. 
uh, this rising debt, where we've seen a significant increase in the amount of debt over the last 50 years that uh, that is involved, in picking different countries, but but largely either in the consumer um, sector or or the uh, or the corporate sector. Uh, the falling taxes, so tax rates uh, for corporates have been really plummeting. Um, uh, the rising trade initially, and then falling trade for the last uh, couple of years, and then this uh, this falling energy costs um, sort of trend that's that's um, yeah, sort of an overlay across across the uh, across the market. And so they, yeah, they're the big they're, they're the big trends that were sort of affecting portfolios at a at a at a, at a macro level. Um, and we'll deal with that later. But now I want to jump into these revolutionary ideas. These are the, you know, what what are the stocks and sectors involved, uh, and, and what are these, um, uh, what are the factors that we're looking at? So the first one is is similar to the that um, uh, the, the idea of the last one of those energy costs, but it's the electrification side in terms of what we're seeing is that uh, solar power and wind power uh, have become the cheapest. Uh, form of energy, if you're, uh, but 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 extremely variable, um, and so you need batteries or, or some sort of sort of energy storage to overlay it to get back to 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 sort of similar to uh, say a coal or, or nuclear. What's been happening though is that the price of solar um, has plummeted over the last. I've got a chart on the left there, just sort of showing um, that you know if you look back over the last sort of few decades, it's tel- it's gone from basically nowhere near the price of um, every other to to yeah, it's a eighty odd degree angle on that on that graph, sort of showing how it's how how fast those costs have come down, and uh, we've got battery costs that are falling on a, on a similar basis um, in terms of the, the cost of batteries. And so, as that sort of comes through, um, we're seeing that uh, you know, battery plus well, not quite seeing it for battery plus solar as being uh, as defeating uh, the other ones in, in all circumstances, but certainly at the margin it started to, and it's it's pushing out. Uh, diesel and and other sort of higher cost um, versions and, and and we're expecting to see that continue to, to to flow through. And what that's meant is there's been a lot of electrification of, of various systems. So uh, regardless, you know, for, for for people that don't believe in climate change or, or whatever, you need to believe that that governments are, di- are still doing something about it. So regardless of you your belief system um, or, or, and whether you believe these numbers, the the fact is uh, new solar is being built all the time and, and in record amounts. Uh, last year was the, the biggest build out ever we've seen, and that so was the year before that. And, and you know, there's, maybe there's one year in the COVID where it was down, but but the, the growth has been significant and is continuing to grow. Uh, wind power is isn't growing as fast, but it's certainly um, uh, consistently adding more more to the the grid. And and the the constant over this is change. And so what we're seeing is regardless of of whether of where we're getting the, the price from, and, and 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 what's happening is there is new sources being plugged in and turned on all the time, and so that's where we're looking for, try, to try and get exposure. So so in terms of the solar farms themselves and trying to get access to sort of the underlying technologies, um, we're less we're less excited about those uh, for a couple of reasons. One is as a sort of big picture view is if I build a solar farm um, today and I, and I get it up and running and plug it into the grid. And then you build another solar farm um, next year, your solar farm will almost certainly be cheaper cheaper than mine in terms of the cost that it took you to get up. So you're, you've effectively got a lower, um, yeah, lower cost of, of, of production than I do, and that's we, we're expecting that to continue for for a significant period of time. And so uh, the actual business itself is um, you know comes back to it, there's not there's not sort of a rising tide that's sort of helping you behind that, but. Where there is opportunity is there's companies that need to plug these things into the network. They need to build the infrastructure. They need to build the transmission lines. They need to build the transformers and you know all all the bits and pieces that go to actually turning these on and 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 including them in the in the network. There are people out there and companies out there who are doing that work, and they're the ones we're trying to get exposure to on that whole electrification side. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of the the big picture on that side. There's uh, in terms of the uh, the actual technologies behind it, so so say the battery technology and the solar technology. Look, um, China is subsidising both of those very heavily, which means that for a lot of companies trying to compete, um, you've got to try and compete with China, who is who is effectively yeah been get for years been giving a free kick to all its companies, which means that the amount you can charge is 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 very low, um, and 
Uh, your other problems in terms of that is that uh, the technology is going through some significant changes. So for battery technology, um, we're seeing this real divergence between uh, batteries for homes, which need to supply actually not very very much power at all, but on a very steady basis, uh, at, versus batteries for cars, which need to supply lots of power really, really quickly. Um, and, and so they, that, so that the, you end up with different technologies that, that's, that's more suited to, to each one and, um, and different cost structures. Uh, and we also have solid state batteries, which is a, 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 they're sort of in, you know, I, um, I sort of think about how evolution of technology goes and, and, and every day you see some new chemistry, new battery chemistry or new sort of, um, uh, thing that's sort of popped up in terms of different, um, different ways and, and new materials and things like that. Most of those are going to take a decade or more to, to, to get to market if they ever do. Whereas um, the technologies that are already being used in small test cases and now now they're trying to scale up, um, they're the ones that we need to be be quite aware of. And those technologies, uh, they're not mature, but they're they're mature enough that we've, we've seen enough that we can sort of um, uh, that we and we can see companies starting to to um, to put these in. And so solid state batteries are very much on that scale, uh, and some of the sodium uh, batteries as well are on that scale. So um, I guess what I'm trying to say here is. There's a lot of different technologies that are, that are coming up and trying to pick a winner is difficult within those. You might think that, yes, I've got the, the world's greatest solid state battery and this is going to be fantastic and, and this company is going to be, yeah, going to, going to boom. And next thing you know, somebody's created some sort of um, yeah, technology that now lets use sodium batteries and ends up costing half the, the cost of your battery. And so, um, yeah, the technology side, I'm, I'm always a bit nervous about. There's some definitely some lottery tickets out there, but but they are lottery tickets. They're not sort of um, uh, investments you can make and and have a a, uh, ex, you know, a a better expected return over a longer period of time. Whereas I I do think the the technology providers and the service providers to this industry they do have a a business model where they make money, recurring revenue streams, um, you know, good good sight into years and years and years of growth. Um, uh, that's certainly where, where I prefer to play that, that theme. So, um, yeah, we've got a number of different countries, companies in this space. Uh, Schneider's a French company that sort of got a lot in, in here, uh, as well, that sort of has, has, uh, has some, and we've got some Japanese companies as well that are ever involved in that process. Um, so that's, that's theme number one, this electrification. Uh, thing number two is obesity and the new obesity drugs. Now we did a whole podcast on this not that long ago. Uh, the idea very much is with these is that the um, there's been a, a new class of drugs have come out. Largely, um, they rely on suppressing appetite, and what that's meant is that we've got we've had this obesity uh, epidemic where obesity has gone from sort of ten percent in 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 um, developed countries in sort of uh, fifty years ago to uh, to, to over forty percent now in, in in the US and and you know fast reaching those levels in, in other places like Australia and the UK um, so so this is, is an epidemic uh, that's meant a lot of money spent on on healthcare um, and obese people take a um, typically uh, have much higher healthcare costs than, than others now we have a effectively a cure for the, for this uh, and so our our what we're um, positing is that this is actually going to uh, have broader effects for society in that the uh, if we can cut out a, a large chunk of healthcare costs because uh, the people at the most obese end of the spectrum now have a a, um, a a way out. Not all of them are going to take it, but you know that, that certainly an, uh, we we're expecting a large enough proportion to to meaningfully affect these numbers. And so what that means is, well, first of all, the the obesity drugs manufacturers themselves there's there's, there's benefits from those. But there's also other effects throughout society in terms of uh, healthcare costs, insurance costs are, are two of the big areas where, where we're playing as well. Um, and, um, and and there's sort of question marks about some of the others in terms of what happens. But, you know, there will be things like fast food and, and gyms and other ones like that where we're still not 100% sure what the what the impact will be. But but you sort of need to be on watch within those within those sectors for, for opportunities in in um, in different directions. Uh, so that's the obesity side. It, in a related note, is um, we've seen and we ran another podcast on this. Um, uh, might have been last week actually. The uh, the idea of that we've got this increased mortality rates 
and um, we do think there's going to be a normalization. So we ran through quite a lot on that. We think we're going to see normalization of, of um, some of those, and that's going to bring down the healthcare costs. That's also going to bring down um, some of the life insurance costs. And we, so we, we think there's a, a play in terms of looking for stocks um, that will, as the, uh, these are the sort of excess deaths we've seen to, from, from COVID and the excess deaths we've seen from people not getting tested and from um, uh, having immune, weakened immune systems and things like that. As that sort of filters out of the system, we think there's a uh, an investment play to, to to go on those as well. Uh, we might go to a message, Sam, and then some more uh, themes after that. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investments. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. Just one more quick thing. We just want to ask you for a simple favor. We want to spread the message about transparency, innovation, and integrity in investing. At Nucleus Wealth, we live and breathe these values. We would love it if you can help us spread that message, and subscribing to our channel will help us do that. We would be most grateful if you can hit the like and subscribe button now. Right, the the next revolutionary opportunity we're looking at is, is... uh the onshoring and robotics side so there's definitely been a a change in the whole dynamic between the us and china and 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 actually quite frankly china and and the rest of the developed world where china was becoming very much the um uh the producer for for all the low value goods and then moving their way up the up the chain now that has stopped um that came to a, a a a relatively decent sized stop um well, sorry, no. That certainly slowed with with uh, tar- Trump and, and a number of tariffs. Um, as we hit COVID, and we had all these supply chain problems. It became very apparent to companies that actually we need to they need to diversify. At the same time, you had the U.S. Um, government starting to put crackdowns on what technology could go to China, and so uh, we've ended up in this scenario where companies are now very much incentivized to be moving their their, their processes out of China. Um, potentially to other developing markets, whether it be um, you know, Mexico, Vietnam, uh, countries like that, but also as well um, putting putting a lot of them back into the US and automating a lot of the processes. And so again, um, we're looking upon this as a, as, as a big theme. The you can certainly see so so the data is a little bit um, uh, let's let's call it messy at the moment in terms of what's happening in this front. So you can sort of pitch arguments in terms of looking at, at the amount of exporting that China's doing and saying, no, no, that actually the exports are now just being re-diverted by our other countries. And so um, they, they're still, the, um, the effect is still that, that uh, had, there hasn't been as much onshoring and, and there hasn't been as much. And um, I think though, when you dig into the data, it's, I think the most compelling chart for me showing this is coming is the the idea of the foreign direct investment, and that's gone negative for the first time um, in whatever it is, 30, 40 years. Um, and what to me that is saying, and, and, and we've certainly seen a fall off in that over the last um, over the last couple of years, and now it's now it's gone negative. And what that's to me is saying, well, look, if if you're Apple and you've built a factory in China and you want to re-onshore and you want to bring things back to, to, to the US or, or to Mexico or Vietnam, whatever, you're not shutting down that, that, that Chinese factory. What you're, starting, what you're doing is saying, okay, I'm not going to put any new, more new factories. As we need new factories, now we're building them in other locations. And, and that is, is really the, the lesson that I'm seeing for, from most companies is that, yeah, it's not a rush for the exit. It's not, there's no sort of drop dead date. Okay, that we've had a pandemic. I've decided I'm not doing anything in China anymore. It's a right, I can't rely on China to be the sole source. Fine, I need to have some diversification. And actually, the political winds are blowing against China. Costs have actually increased a fair bit in China as well. And so it actually, a, a number of factors sort of fall into place that make sense to, to look at alternatives. And that's what we're seeing in that investment 
foreign direct investment into China is that companies have stopped investing, uh, and that's where um, that's the, the lead in, the leading edge of this. And then over the next few years, we'll, we'll see the, the 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 impacts of that. And so, what we're really looking for is is companies again um, that. Are the service providers to these? So we're looking for companies that are doing the robotics. Uh, we're looking for companies that are are, are involved in the in the spend um, for setting up, um, you know, uh, constructing commercial facilities and, and and things like that. So we've got a number of stocks in ours, and there is some overlap. Some of the ones I spoke about before, um, Schneider and ABB both do some sort of robotics and automation as well. Um, but there's a number of other stocks we have in our portfolios, and, and the idea is that what we're trying to do is really look for stocks that are, that are, that are um, exposed to that trend and avoid stocks that um, that might be more exposed to to a uh, to just sort of the China exposure uh, the next theme is um, cloud and, and AI computing now there's a uh, we read a few things we've run a few podcasts on that as well particularly Nvidia and 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 the cost of Nvidia now, I like NVIDIA. Um, it's got a great outlook. It's the profits are, are growing quickly. Uh, it is a question about price very much for, for NVIDIA, about how much you want to pay for that. Um, having said that, and and sorry, and they have this massive market share. So it's a, cost of, it's a matter of two things. They've got this massive market share. Will they manage to maintain all that market share or will that, um, or will that come back to something more normal? And then how fast will the industry grow, itself grow? Now, I do think the industry itself is going to grow very quickly. Um, there's a lot of big players trying to spend a lot of money to to, to catch up with Nvidia, and um, I do think there's going to be, well, it, it, I mean, it'd be surprising if if none of them come up with something that doesn't take at least a little bit of market share. And so, um, you know, places like Intel, uh, Google, Amazon are all sort of working on their own. All sort of very big companies with very big research and development budgets are all working on their own sort of uh, uh, their own chips. Uh, AMD as well. So, uh, what we're looking for here is is companies. Uh, so that's one side on the AI. Also within that, uh, there is this. There's COVID has really accelerated um, the whole switch to to putting things on the cloud as well. So there was a mass. We went through this massive part where a lot of companies um, were very much of the view that no, we don't want stuff on the cloud. It's not safe. Um, we want to have everything internally. We want to have it in our offices. We've got control over it. You know, a whole bunch of different arguments along that front. Then the then COVID happens and they had to put stuff on the cloud. They had to give access to people for work from home because um, they had no other choice. And that's now I think broken the um, uh, broken the seal, and it's it's led to that whole realization for a lot of companies is actually when I put stuff on the cloud, it gets at least fifty percent cheaper. Sometimes as much as eighty or ninety percent cheaper for companies to to run their their servers on the cloud rather than rather than locally because uh, yeah most servers don't get used to their full capacity every minute of the day. Um, and uh, by having it on the cloud, you're effectively sharing, um, you know, sharing that provision across a whole bunch of different, um, uh, yeah, across a whole bunch of different uh, suppliers. So, uh, so yeah, so we're expecting that to continue to grow. Uh, we're looking for companies that are involved, that get, um, uh, that get the benefits as more money spent on data centers, more money spent on, on uh, cloud computing. And so some of the bigger players in that are, um, are Microsoft, uh, Google, um, uh, a number of other smaller names that sort of fit into that. And so they're the ones we're sort of very much trying to um, trying to look for as well. Amazon's one that's not in our portfolio, uh, but look, we love the the AWS side of the business. It's just a um, question about how much you want to pay for um, uh, the rest of the, the Amazon business. And, and at, at, we have our, our lines where we're like, yes, at, at this price, we're we're, we're buying Amazon. Um, it's got close a few times, but as it actually hasn't sort of fallen over that uh, over that line. But we're certainly uh, you know, a stock that's on our radar as one we want to own. But it's a matter of getting it for the right price. Whereas Microsoft and Google, we feel have been more reasonably priced. And 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 um, yeah, and there's some other, as I said, there's some other smaller stocks, um, uh, so especially some of the um, the 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 semiconductor stocks that make the machines that make the machines. Um, sort of one one level, uh, sort of abstracted that we um, that we've quite uh, that we quite like that we've got within our portfolio as well. Uh, the next theme is uh, is is gas. So coming back to the energy sector, now we've been underweight 
uh, oil for some time. There's certain, there's definitely at, at, at lower oil prices, we're, we're certainly more interested. Um, one of the things I want to highlight though, is that the prices you pay for gas in the U S are about somewhere between a, fi- a third and a fifth of the, um, I should tell you, probably, no, it's about a, a fifth to maybe a 10th of the price you might pay in Europe, um, for, for, for a lot of this gas. Now, given the, uh, the situation with Russia and, and how, uh, Europe's going off Russian gas, there's a whole bunch of gas, uh, LNG plants that are coming on, uh, over the next coming years. I've got a chart up to sort of showing that we're based, that the U S is sort of, um, roughly doubling, um, maybe actually probably, maybe even a little bit more than doubling, um, over the next, um, uh, what is it? Four years, the, the amount of LNG that they that they've got, that will go, most of it will go to, to Europe. Some of it will go to, um, uh, will go to Asia as well. But you know, realistically, I think some of the, the gas that ends up in Asia will, will, that just means some of the gas in say Qatar will end up going to Europe rather than, rather than go to Asia. Uh, and so what that means is what we're expecting is a, um, rather than the gas in the U S trading at an 80% discount to, to what you, what you might find elsewhere, that discount will, will, um, will lessen. Now, the other thing that might happen in the, in the meantime as well is if, if you do get any pullback in terms of the oil uh, production in the U S what happens in the U S is that a lot of the shale, uh, oil producers produce gas as a bit of a byproduct. And so what they'll do is they'll pull out uh, an amount of, of, of gas and oil, and they might be able to sell, you know, let's say they pull out a barrel of oil and they can sell that for $80. They might also pull out, you know, a few dollars worth of gas at the same time as, as a byproduct. And sometimes, or, well, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they used to even just flare that gas off. They just like literally burn it because they go this, we can't be bothered putting this to market. So we'll just burn it off. Nowadays, it, it is typically just sent into the gas system. And that's part of the reason why the, for the low gas prices in Europe is that uh, this gas is um, is a byproduct. Sorry, low gas prices in the US is that this gas is a byproduct and so it's pumped in at whatever cost. Um, sometimes there's even negative costs on on this. Uh, and so, uh, and companies are just happy to, to, to get rid of the gas because they, they, they're doing this production for the oil. So... What we've done is we've uh, we're more exposed to the the specialist gas producers in in this space, and it, our take is that as LNG as these LNG plants ramp up, then the gap in 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 gas price between the US and the rest of the world will will lessen. And as a second part is if we do have any pullback in uh, the amount of oil production, then the oil guys will produce less gas as well, which will then probably add to the uh, the gas price in 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 the US. And so. Um, it's not a it's not a massive overweight. We're still underweight the energy sector more generally with with some of the views we have, but um, uh, specifically within this space, we think there's a a uh, an investment opportunity over the next few years. Uh, and then the final ones for for stuff we're looking for. Keep in mind, we ha- I've got a bunch more of ones which we're looking to avoid that we'll we'll talk about in a minute. But the final ones are the ones we're we're looking for is is quality companies now. What do I mean by that? I mean companies that, that earn, um, that have economic moats uh, in in the Warren Buffett speak. So they earn a lot of money. Uh, they earn high margins, and uh, they have uh, a reasonable amount of pricing power. And the reason why I'm looking for quality stocks rather than value stocks is because value stocks are the stocks that that tend not to have high margins, and they tend to have less pricing power. And in our view. Um, as you've seen rising inflation, that's meant that all companies have now had, have had a chance to, to, to increase their prices over the last few years. We think that's going away. And there's a number of signs that are, that are, that are showing that that's agreeing with us. And that what that's going to do is that's going to put margins under pressure over the next 12 to 18 months. And you're going to see in some industries, like say the, the shipping um, industry, they at one stage were, well, before the whole coronavirus, they were shipping from say China to the the US for for say about a thousand dollars a a um, uh, a container, they got to ramp those prices up to over ten thousand dollars. But now the prices have fallen pretty close back down to the the original amounts. And so um, they're the companies without that pricing power. And and so whatever prices price gains they got through, they had to give them up. That's what we're looking for now is the companies that won't have to give up their pricing power. 
and margins are at sort of pretty close to record highs, um, as we can see from this chart I've got up here, which is just so showing the US uh, profit margins uh, pretty close to, to to record highs. Is that our expectation is that um, yeah a number of those companies are going to have to give it back, and we're going to see a lot of pressure in terms of those margins over the next uh, eighteen months. So I might go back to you, Sam. We'll be back again shortly. If you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. Now direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at nucleuswealth.com. Now back to the show. Right, the other side of these trades is, is what are the themes that you need to try and avoid? And there's, we've got sort of five of those uh, that, that are, are related, I think, to some of the uh, existing ones. So the first one um, uh, is the, the China inter-terminal decline. So uh, what, we, what we're saying there is China has gone ex-growth and it has demographic issues. It's spent an extraordinary amount on, um, uh, on both building and infrastructure, and it's run out of projects to do in both those. Uh, it's also got these, this massive debt burden that's built up over the, over the past couple of years. And what we're effectively seeing there is the Japanification. They're going to go into a, a long and, um, uh, extended sort of, uh, uh, period of, of low growth. Now, you, you, they could have gone another direction. They could have decided to, to have a whole bunch of write-offs and have a big financial crisis and, and, and then sort of reset everything and, and then and then start again, sort of similar to what the US did post uh, financial crisis, but they've opted not to. And, and we suspect that will, that will continue as, as much as China is able to, is to get, is to run the sol the Japanese path, which is basically to, to extend the pain for a lot, lot longer. Um, but, but each year the pain is, is, is only a little bit. And so, um, stocks that are on the other side of that, um, resources in particular, uh, are ones that we're, we're looking to avoid. Um, but you know, at, at, again, at the right price, we'll talk about pricing in a minute, but, but, you know, it, if the, um, commodity prices that are well above their long-term averages and well above the costs of production, uh, they're the ones where we're suggesting that you, uh, you need to, um, uh, need to be clear of in terms of those. And then anything, any other companies that, that were really based on that whole China rising over the last couple of decades is, is now it's time to, to be shifting out of those stocks. Uh, Driverless cars and electric vehicles. So, and, and we've sort of posted a few times on this. Our view is that look, electric vehicles are not really economic at the current at current levels. Uh, given the way battery prices are falling, that's probably going to change over the next couple of years. Um, and so, you will continue to see a, a rise in electric vehicles. A lot of that, though, is really about real range anxiety. And and the reason why is because most people don't drive more than a hundred kilometers a day. And if you, if all you need is a battery that will go, will get you a hundred kilometers a day, then electric vehicles are economic and, and look more attractive than, than, than petrol cars right now. But most people don't, most people want a much longer battery. They want a battery that rather than a hundred kilometers a day, will take them six or 700 kilometers in a day. And so that effectively means you're looking for a battery that's six or seven times more expensive. And so, um, the payback period is so much longer. So, um, and, and at the same time, so that's the electric vehicle side. We'll get there, but you know, that, so, so keeping an eye on stocks that are going to suffer from uh, as as the as electric vehicles rise. But on the other side, we have these um, we have the driverless cars that are that look like they're going to start going into um, an exponential growth phase over the next few years. So Google sort of got up and running in in one city um, in uh, in in Arizona uh, a couple of years ago. They've moved into, um, and sorry, when I say Google, it's the 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 the, the company name is Waymo. Um, so they're operating you know, driverless taxi services there. They they've launched in San Francisco now as well, so they've added a second city to it. Uh, they have 
um, starting to get it up and running in, in uh, three other different cities throughout the US. Uh, they're in sort of a, in a build out mode in, in three different cities. And the question is, if those ones go successful, does three become 10, does 10 become 100? And you go through that 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 growth phase. So it's so it's not a um, uh, there there've been lots of uh, there've been lots more roadblocks in in in, uh, in that than what we've thought over the last few years. But it does seem as if it's getting close to that exponential growth phase. And so we really and if you're running a driverless car now, electric vehicles make a lot of sense because uh, if you're talking, especially about these driver if it's a driverless taxi, is that I don't when I get into a taxi, I don't care how how far the guy's got to go as long as it gets me where I need to. If that car then needs to go and drive off and recharge itself, that's its problem, not my problem. So, uh, and they have a much better feel for they can, they know how many kilometers, they know how big the batteries need to be, and they know they don't need to be that large, and they can charge keep charging them throughout the day. And so, yeah, the driverless cars could could really make a big difference. So, um, we're very much looking for for, for themes we, for stocks that we want to avoid um, if we're going to see that rise of, of of driverless cars and the rise of electric vehicles, and that means. Um, and what that means for, 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 you know, in a big picture is there's about a hundred billion cars, um, produced every year is if you've got a driverless car that is that, um, you know, basically drives about 10 times more than, than your average car, that's going to be replacing a lot of those cars. And so it'll be that people aren't getting a second car or a third car or, or whatever it is to, you know, and at some stage people won't get the first car, but the, um, uh, yeah, that that rise of that could make a significant dent in terms of that whole um, car production industry, and then all the associated servicing. You don't need to do anywhere near as much servicing on the electric vehicles. Um, uh, yeah, keeps going through that that whole process there, where uh, yeah, lots of others. Lot, there's lots of other onflow from that. So uh, that's the second theme to avoid. The third theme to avoid is is um, the other side of that quality one. So the the stocks that are going to have to give back their margin gains in a recession. And so, um, or, or give, or in, in um, uh, you know, a, a weak economy, and something like a car company, I'd put in that same boat. Where, um, you know, the the if you're Honda or if you're um, VW, yeah, you got a little bit of pricing power, but realistically, if everyone else is cutting their costs, and if cheap Chinese um, uh, cars are coming in at at forty percent cheaper than your cars, then you have to you you're going to have to lower your prices as much as you don't want to and as much as the companies are saying they're going to be more disciplined this time and not have to cut their margins um, when push comes to shove and volumes start to fall they will cut their margins uh whereas there's other other stocks um that say it's something like a microsoft uh where it's managed to get through some price rises for 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 its office products uh they're unlikely to sort of then have to say well we're going to, have to start cutting our prices in order to keep the volumes up uh, that's, that's our third theme. The fourth theme to avoid, uh, so there's this slow motion office bust going on as, as, you know, work from home and, and changes in terms of, uh, the way people are using offices, uh, is going on. And so there's lots of vacancies around, uh, so stocks that are going to continue, that, that are going to suffer from that are, are, are stocks we're, we're looking to try and avoid. And then the final theme is stocks on the other side of that obesity trade. So I'm still not 100% sure of which ones these are. I've got, there's certainly ones I'm avoiding buying, say, some of the fast food and, and um, you know, gyms and, and things like that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure they're all going to be as affected as I, as I think. But, um, you know, I'm, I guess if it's a question about giving these the benefit of the doubt, um, at the moment, I'm, I'm not going to give them the benefit of the doubt until I see how, exactly how much they are affected. And actually, that flows through into some of the, a lot of the healthcare stocks as well. So um, the question is, if if uh, you're looking at a disease where being obese is a um, is a huge factor in in that disease, then we're expecting lower profits for those or, or lower revenues for for those companies because a lot of their patients will now, rather than being assigned whatever drug um, to treat, say, a heart disease problem or or, or or a uh, um, you know a, a respiratory problem, uh, if if they're being assigned an obesity drug that l reduces their symptoms, then um, it's yeah it, there's there's less revenue for the for the other um, people within that. So yes, yeah, so, so 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 some of the healthcare so, uh, sector where we're certainly looking to um, to scale back the holdings and, and and question about what we hold within that. So that's the themes. We might go to the question of the week, and then I'll I'll got some other thoughts on on investment views for these stocks. 
Excellent. So question of the week, this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days. The question for this week is, which trend do you think is going to be the most and which will change society the most? They can be different trends, so feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers over the coming days. Yeah. So and, uh, yeah. I guess what I mean by that as well, just to, just to sort of frame it for people, is that there might be trends where, and probably AI is a good example of one of these, and we've spoken about all the trends we've got above, but say it's AI is saying, well, the companies involved actually might be giving away their software at really low prices and actually not making massive amounts on it, but every company might benefit from just improving its productivity a little bit and not having to spend as much on yeah, marketing, compliance, you know, copywriting, whatever it is, and might have this this productivity boost for everyone. And so it, it might actually be not that not as profitable for investors, but actually it might change society significantly. Or or there'll be other ones which um you know might be wildly profitable and change society at the same time. So yeah, so it's all a, all a question for um be very interested to see what what people's comments are. Now onto the last one, um the investment the, this you know we haven't got it Pretty much the whole thing's been the investment abuse, this one. So so I haven't got a specific investment side, but I do want to highlight on this point that price really matters. So all the tr all the trends I've been talking about are, are themes and what where we're looking at the fundamentals for, for, for these companies. For each of these, you need to have an idea about what price is too high for, for, for these. And um, you know, I'll trot out my my age old example of of uh, of, of Cisco. Cisco is a, um, a a router. It makes routers and, and basically the plumbing of the internet. In the in the tech boom, it rose rose to incredible prices um, with the view that this was a great company. It was you know it was the uh, an architect of the internet and, and did all the plumbing and it would be required and and so growth would it, it would it would keep growing uh, earnings throughout. And that was absolutely true in terms of its earnings. You look at its earnings and they're a sort of forty five degree angle for the last twenty something years. And every year that is keep getting more and more and the profit keeps ticking up and, you know, great company within that. Um, the issue for Cisco is if you had a board in the tech boom, you're still down on that, on that investment. So, you know, we're almost 25 years later and you're still underwater on your investment. So despite the fact this company did, you know, for the, from the fundamentals, a lot of what people said it was going to do. And yes, it's still one of the plum plumbers of the architect of the internet, um, People don't look at, at at Cisco and say, "Well, yes, I've I've become so much more productive from from the internet. Therefore, I'm going to pay Cisco all this extra money." Um, and and so what what I'm getting to is each of these themes. Um, there's a fundamental side. You can you get that part right? But you can also buy these these stocks at, at far too expensive at a price that are far too expensive. And so uh, everything we do within this is very much you know you need to keep flipping back and forth between the two. Love the theme now. How much is it priced at? Is it realistic that they could actually make that? Has it already priced in like some sort of super success, and so it's going to have it's going to have to really blow the lights out to to um to actually make uh, investment sense, or it actually is it just priced for a moderate amount of success, and so you know any anything above that would um would actually result in a, in a good return to investors. So that's uh, that's it, Sam. I might leave it that leave it there. Yeah, one thing I want to add as well, Damo, is uh, all the themes that have been t uh, discussed today, they are in the active portfolios. Um, but if you do want to take advantage of them in the passive portfolios, we do have the screens and the tilts. So the screens, they can, uh, or the tilts, sorry, they can be an extra exposure in the portfolio or as an actual standalone portfolio. Uh, so within the tilts, we've got the clean energy tilt, uh, cloud computing, AI, battery supply chains, robotics, cybersecurity. Uh, so there's lots to choose from depending on you know how you want to play that. Uh, and then we've also got screens as well, which you can exclude from the portfolio. You know things like no fossil fuels, no no coal seam gas. Um, so yeah, around a hundred different screens and tilts to choose from. So feel free to check them out on the website. And, and you can look uh, at the active ones as well. So if you look at ours going, okay, because we show you the portfolio, when you, when you go through the, the sign-up process, you get, we sort of show you, here's your portfolio and the exposures. So if you're looking at it going, actually, you know, I like what you've done, but actually I think that cloud computing is going to be way better than what you're expecting. Um, and I love those stocks. You can add, you can add a, a little bit more yeah, to cloud computing over the, as an overlay over those 
Yeah, so feel free to get in touch if you uh, if you want to know more. Um, we're happy to have a chat about it. And uh, Damo, I'm sure this is uh, you know something we're going to be commenting on over the coming years and, and weeks. Um, you know, these themes are not going anywhere; they're here to stay. So um, yeah, we look forward to the next instalment. Thanks, Sam. Excellent. So we do welcome your feedback on this podcast, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. If you do have any ideas, please drop it in the comments section below, or you can send us an email to contacts at nuclearswealth.com. Also, if you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do share it with them. So that wraps us up for today. So from myself, Damien, and the rest of the team at Nuclear Swealth, thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.